This is the story of X-ray pioneer and forgotten inventor Thomas Burton Kinraid from Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts. Kinraid built a 25-room mansion known as Ravenscroft, and in 2005 my wife and I had the opportunity of visiting this home in hopes of finding artifacts from this time period. After entering the home, we asked to see the basement first, and were led down some stairs to a solid mahogany ballroom the entrance of which was a hidden door, a trap door inside a small room that contained a safe. The ballroom was lined in solid mahogany and there were remnants from Kinraid's time period including animals that he hunted that were still on the walls. After leaving the impressive ballroom we entered the basement which had some utility rooms, an oil furnace, and a peculiar closet off to the side. I had asked to look in the closet, and when I opened the door, I realized it was not a small room, but a series of passages that circled the bottom of the house. They were blasted out of rock and had dirt and leaves on the floor. There was no electric lighting. We had to rely on the flash of our camera and f flashlights to be able to see. Inside the rooms were artifacts from Kinraid's laboratory. We read about these over ten years prior in Frederick Finch Strong's book, High Frequency Currents. In these rooms is where Kinraid made the initial x-rays, the most powerful generated up until that time. He was using a modified high frequency coil of his own design, known as the Kinraid coil. We also found crates of glass plate negatives, 8x10 and 11x14 inches. On these plates were photographs of electrical discharges. These discharges were often described in Tesla lectures, but never photographed. Kinraid made a hobby of this and made hundreds upon hundreds of studies of electrical discharges, sparks, phenomena, and forms. He had named the positive discharges Feliciform and the negative Plumus, and also pointed out various comets and entities relating to electrical discharges. His most famous photographs were of the electrical entity, which showed positive and negative electricity united back to back. As we continued to explore, we found whiskey barrels, jigs and wooden fixtures, lamp fixtures made by Kinraid, and a box containing beeswax, rosin, and coils wrapped in newspaper from Christmas Eve, 1898. These coils were wound with special triple and quadruple silk-covered wire. They were insulated in beeswax and rosin, they were sandwiched between glass rods tied in silk and matched Kinraid's patents from the late 1800s. We also found some capacitors used in his experiments, various dischargers, the remains of a 10-inch induction coil that had been disassembled, and rarest of all was a hybrid high-frequency induction coil from 1897. It was this coil that he made the world's most powerful x-rays up until that time. We found a 14-inch pancake coil that he used to balance his glass negatives to make photos, and a Victorian toilet tank, an oak box lined with copper, which contained the hybrid high-frequency induction coil. In the last room, there were concreted off sections and a peculiar trap door that led about 20 feet down. We couldn't find any other rooms below us, or at least any access points, but we believe this is where Kinraid demonstrated the original Keeley motor after Keeley had passed away. We also found glass plate negatives showing the plain evidences of fraud found once the Keeley motor was disassembled. Before leaving Ravenscroft, we were shown to the roof where we saw a view overlooking Boston. We visited the Kinraid home again in 2007, and it wasn't until 2010 that we got an unexpected call to return to Boston, 
after Cheryl and Travis, two urban explorers, found an original Kinraid coil. To enter this building that had been abandoned more than 50 years, we had to find an electrical room with conduit that run through a two foot wide shaft into the basement of the school. Crawling through the shaft, we come up through the basement and found over six floors of abandoned equipment and floors that had collapsed in upon themselves from years of neglect. It was in the attic of this school that the Kinraid coil was found. Accompanying us on this adventure was Rebecca Kinraid and her husband Toby, and they are now the proud owners of the original Kinraid coil, which is in all likelihood the oldest x-ray machine in the United States and the oldest complete surviving Tesla coil or high frequency coil. Before we get into the construction of the Kinraid coil, it would do well to describe why it came about. And this holds true of, of why the Tesla coil or the Thompson coil or any high frequency coil come about. Um, in this time period, uh, after the discovery of the X-ray, um, there were very few ways of generating high voltage. Uh, one way to produce X-rays powerful enough was with a large static machine. Now this is a 24 plate static machine, 7 foot tall, 6 foot across, and 4 foot deep. Another option was the induction coil or the Ritchie coil. Uh, this is Ritchie's 12th coil from 1868. It has a, a hand interrupter and contains 68,000 feet of wire in the secondary. Right after the Civil War, it cost $257. Like Tesla, Kinraid started his high frequency experiments using modified forms of induction coils. However, due to burnouts, he then began to develop uh, his well known Kinraid coil. And this contained only two secondary coils connected in series with each other, and two concentric primaries also connected in series. This allowed the highest potential to be in an area of least resistance. The power transformer used in the Kinraid coil is extremely unique. It's the lowest voltage of any commercial Tesla coil ever made. Uh, the primary was 104 volts and was wound in two sections. And the secondary, also wound in two sections, provided only 900 volts to charge the capacitor. The transformer is unique and it's one of the first AC transformers ever made or mass produced. It has a core of fine iron wires uh, identical to an induction coil. And to make it a closed circuit transformer, thin steel laminations were bolted to the ends of these fine iron wires. The transformer at full power consumed 200 watts from the wall. One of the most unusual features of the Kinraid coil is the water-cooled spark gap. This was a true quenched gap designed some six years before the famous Telefunken gap in Germany. The gap consists of a small brass table onto which the bottom spark gap segment is placed, which is a copper disc just under six inches in diameter. A lever can be swung forward or reverse that raises the copper segment up or down several thousandths of an inch. The upper contact of the spark gap is a 6 inch plate that's placed on three delta posts 120 degrees apart around the bottom plate. By adjusting these three points of the plane, exact parallelism of the upper and lower contacts can be made. To keep the gap cool, a, a jug of water is placed on the upper segment. This forms, in a sense, a self-recuperative condenser, as called out in Tesla's lectures. Even though the transformer is 900 volts, the spark dances along the surface of the plates, even though they're only 10 or 15 thousandths of an inch apart, and makes a beautiful spark gap. The Kinraid coil itself is contained in a hard rubber molding, this was one of the most expensive pieces of the apparatus back at the turn of the century. 
This molding conforms to the electrical requirements of the coil, having the most insulation in the middle where the voltage is the highest. The Kinraid coil was filed in 1897 patented 1898, and it matches the original prototypes we found at Ravenscroft. Unfortunately, the original Kinraid coils were burned out. It appears the machine was left unintended for a long period of time while it was energized. As a result, we had to rewind both secondary coils. Each secondary has around a thousand turns of wire when completed. After winding the coils, it's time to now test them on low power. We're testing them here with about 50 watts of power to the main transformer. Before placing the coils in their original molds, one of the molds had to be restored. It had been cracked over time and it was recast with a black insulating resin. Now both coil forms are ready to receive the coils. Before the coils could be cast, I had to turn on a lathe the two upright posts that connected the innermost turns of the coil with the electrode socket at the top of the Kinraid coil molds. I also had to do some torch work to form some glass rods that are used as insulating supports on the inside molds of the Kinraid coil. This allowed the coils to be placed in and hot wax to be cast around without having the coils themselves distort and deform. Small hard rubber posts also had to be turned in order to insulate the outermost turns of the pancakes. Here we're melting beeswax and violin rosin in equal parts. This is one of the best electrical insulations known today and has been used since the 1700s. We have Tesla coils 100 years old that still function fine using this wonderful insulation. Here are the molds cast and waiting to harden. And hours later, we have a finished Kinraid coil. It's now time to polish the molds and start testing again.
During this video, the coil is consuming only 90 watts of power. For historical reference, here are scale models of three of the earliest manufactured Tesla coils. A 6 inch diameter spark gap, a half microfarad condenser, a 900 volt transformer, and a pair of low frequency pancake coils may seem far from what a usual Tesla coil is by today's standards, but the Kinraid coil represented uh, one of the most efficient high-frequency coils ever designed, and the concepts can still be used today to produce x-rays of enormous power. The machine is also useful for studying electric discharges, and is one of the few machines that can produce a variety of discharges unlike most cylindrical Tesla coils. Over the last 10 years, I've wound more than 100 pancake coils and have studied the researches of Tesla and Kinraid, replicating many of their experiments and witnessing the sparks seen in the following photos. These sparks can only be seen to be appreciated, and hopefully future generations of Tesla coilers and enthusiasts might look to the past to rediscover some of these magnificent discharges. The earliest static machine was from Otto von Goerich in the late 1600s. He built a static machine in the form of a small sulfur sphere. He poured molten sulfur into a glass ball and, and then as it cooled broke the ball, put an axle through it. And he found when he rotated it with one hand and rubbed it with the other, it was an electric and it would become charged. And small bits of paper and dust would stick to the outside of the globe. Now, von Goerich made an argument against Gilbert's theory that the Earth was a large magnet. As von Goerich said, if the Earth was a magnet, then things would be stuck more at the poles, the North and South Pole, and it doesn't seem to be the case. So, von Goerich said, hey, the Earth must be a, an electric, or dielectric at the, and then this time, and that when he spun his globe, things stuck to it evenly, and small bits of paper once in a while would be thrown off of the globe and then reattracted again. And it was always the same face that stuck to the globe. So uh, Gurek said that uh, that's why we always see the same face of the moon. So it wasn't exactly correct, but uh, a good theory anyway. Uh, this is a small replica of uh, such a globe. Um, I added a collector to this one to demonstrate the electricity. 
Uh, you can either use your bare hand, or I sometimes just hold a paper towel against it. But it becomes highly charged. You can see it generates a small amount of electricity. Now, frictional machines, typically late 16, early 1700s, by the 1900s, they're always said to be almost useless. And you can still generate sparks with these machines. Uh, Hawksby was one of the early pioneers that really turned Gurek's idea into something practical. One thing you can make is a large globe with a handle, you rotate it, apply friction to one end. You may not be able to hear the electric being generated, but you can feel a fuzz all the way around it. And to collect the electricity, one of the best ways is Franklin's power of points. If you take a prime conductor, such as this, and outfit it with a comb and some points, As you now rotate the globe, the electricity is drawn off as soon as it's generated and it's collected in this small sphere. But these are the earliest types of static machines and uh, ones that a lot of important discoveries were made, especially by Hawksby in light, the idea that quicksilver can be illuminated if you put a slight vacuum there. Uh, he's really the pioneer of fluorescent lighting more than than Tesla or Cooper Hewitt or anyone else. Uh, even this idea of Geisler tubes and Gazio tubes, they actually are traced back to Hawksby. He really did some amazing research and papers that combined electricity, friction, and vacuums. And it's all around 1705, which uh, he was way ahead of his time and sort of in a league auto himself because Franklin and other guys didn't come around for another 50 years and do their work. The next machine of great historical importance was the Carre dielectric machine from 1868. Um, this machine took the idea of a frictional generator and added another disc to it. And this disc, by influence, generated an opposite charge, which was collected. And this idea of influence carried on into the modern static machines, like the Tepler Holtz and Wimshurst machines. Um, but you can see in the, the bottom of this machine there's a small disc and there's a set of friction pads that rub against it. Just like in Gurek machines that used your hand rubbing against the sulfur globe, in this machine uh, there were wooden, uh, a wooden clamp assembly with leather pads attached to the assembly. They were leather and typically stuffed with like a horsehair to make a little cushion. And they were covered with an amalgam that was typically tin and zinc 50% uh, tin, 50% zinc, 
it was ground up, melted together, and added to another uh, part of mercury. And this not only added to the friction, it generated more electricity, it also helped to ground the pads, which was an important aspect of the functioning of the machines. Um, in this machine here, I haven't added any amalgam for safety reasons. Um, they also found later on that by adding bisulfuret of tin uh, on top of the amalgam, you could generate even more static electricity. And this was something that was found out much later, after the fact. But uh, these clamps were typical of plate machines, uh, such as the winter machine. And they made an easier task of operating the machine because you, you had one free hand that you could do experiments with. With the von Goerich globe, you had one hand turning the crank, the other one touching the machine. There wasn't, wasn't many hands to do anything else with. But turning the crank of this machine, you can start to hear the static generate immediately. It produces quite a bit of current for a small amount of work. Now, without Leiden jars, it's limited how much it actually produces. As I turn the crank, even from this distance I can feel all the hair in my face standing on end. This was a classic machine used for therapy. can't see in the video are all is all the hair on my arm standing on end. Um, the next video is going to show a Leiden jar in connection with this and by adding a small amount of capacity the output's greatly increased. this doesn't wreck havoc with the computer, nothing will. Uh, this is a Tepler Holtz machine from the uh, 1870s, from McIntosh Battery and Optic Company. It was invented by Philip Atkinson, who is uh, 
a pioneer of this type of apparatus in the States and a very efficient machine. Um, in a warm environment, unlike Florida, it was said to produce 80, 60, or 86 inch sparks a minute. Uh, the machine has a rotating plate that's a little over two foot in diameter and a stationary plate of about 30 inches. Two Leiden jars are in the front. Uh, everything's nickel plated brass and all of the insulators are hard rubber in this machine. So I turn the crank, after a few seconds we'll be able to hear the charge building up. There it goes. You can hear the charge build and regenerate after each spark on the discs. Now you'll note in that video that sometimes you hear the spark but you don't see it and that's because this video if it's 30 frames a second the spark may be uh, forming in between that. The actual duration of the spark is very very quick even though it appears to be there a long time with the naked eye. It happens in just fractions of a second.
This is a thunderstorm machine by W.C. Shin, 1907. And it was a classic type of machine. It was used to demonstrate lightning rods. Could be carried door to door or brought to businesses. And uh, the concepts of lightning strikes and static electricity could be demonstrated. The machine often come with small barns or houses that you could generate the static electricity around and show a lightning strike, say, uh, from a theoretical cloud to the top of the building. And uh, by installing small lightning rods that correspond to those the company were selling, you could show how the phenomena could be prevented. And the lightning rod is generally attributed to Ben Franklin, but uh, a little known Moravian inventor, Prokrop Dibish, actually come up with the concept of, of grounding the rods. But uh, this is a great machine, a uh, great way of demonstrating static electricity. It won't take long after turning the crank to hear the, the hiss of static start to be generated. There it goes.
Today I'm going to demonstrate a portable Tesla coil that was sold for x-ray use in the first decade of the 1900s. Um, it was invented by James Seeley, who was an early pioneer in high frequency ignition coils. Uh, Seeley started off with a company Synchronous Static, and then it was Vulcan Coil Company, and finally Seeley Electric Laboratories. Now I don't know much history on Seeley, but I do know that uh, after 1910, the machines were continuing to be sold for dental use and making dental x-rays. And this was kind of normal for most early Tesla coils because they were found to be practical for softer tissues, but uh, for the real heavy radiographs, uh, as technologies changed, uh, exposure times were a little bit too long. So uh, this is the classic example of a machine that did take that route. It started off as medical and then followed up as a dental machine. But uh, the machine's portable in the sense that it can be carried. It weighs over 50 pounds. But in the lid of the machine, you can see the electrodes that plug into the socket. Now, there's two pancake coils here in the upper section of the left-hand side of the machine. Under that, there's a high-voltage transformer. There's a large mica capacitor. There's a variable reactance coil under here. And there's a knob on the top from 0 to 7 that controls how much current goes through the apparatus. In addition to that, there's a momentary push switch over here that lets a full 15 amps go through the coils. Uh, there's a little window over here that you can see this spark gap below. It's a single gap that's about an eighth inch by maybe one and a half inch of rectangular sections that the gap forms a arc between and they seem to be heavily silver plated. It's kind of reminiscent of the Jackson coil spark gap that Kinray developed earlier on. I'll plug the electrodes and the pancake coils. The pancake coils are unique in Seeley's apparatus and he claimed both primary and secondary coils were wound with copper ribbon. Now, in the secondary coil, it would have been a much finer ribbon. In the primary coils, it was a standard one inch wide copper ribbon. These are the dischargers. And this machine's missing the original tube holder that uh, would actually hold the x-ray tube if you were making radiographs. Uh, it's a unique machine that had a special, almost a screwdriver, to, to turn the current selections on the side. There's a little recessed slotted screw in there. And on low power... On low power, it still produces almost an 8-inch discharge between the terminals. Uh, at that time, most machines were only putting out 5 or 6-inch sparks. So one of the first things that set Sealy's machines apart were the large spark gap that was offered on the top of the machine for the tubes. Now I'll run through the power levels from 1 to 7. Now, I'll make a note of saying on power level 3, I was beginning to see orange along with violet in the discharge of this coil. 
So it, there is a bit of current behind the sparks. And that last setting was a very evil setting 7. Now, as you increase the power, it sometimes helps to close the gap a little to get the flaming discharge. That momentary button on the side It produces pure fire between the terminal, and I can actually feel heat on my face here. Now, the discharge, when seen by the eye here, is actually an orangish-yellow, in addition to the purple you normally see. Um, I can try and put a dark background behind it. It actually looks like a low-frequency arc at that point. But very efficient Tesla coil, very powerful. Um, it does produce x-rays. I've, I've witnessed uh, the high frequency tube uh, functioning with this machine. Um, it's a good example of compact engineering. Uh, it's, it is larger than most portable sets at that time, but the output it produces is much larger in addition um, to that. It's a, it's a machine that would have been great to use in science demos later on. I don't know the history of Seeley as far as what happened to him after a lot of the early pioneers got involved in the war effort and communications. <clears throat> I don't know exactly in Seeley's case um, what happened later on. Uh, I do know that he was a very prolific inventor in the first decade of the 1900s. Uh, his patents are really interesting and uh, there's some great machines that we've never seen actual examples of. There are patents of, for example, machines that have synchronous um, transformers involved. So if you're operating them on AC, you uh, sort of synchronous, in a synchronous way, rectify the output by using various magnetic circuits incorporated in the spark gap, say, for example. Um, um, very ingenious uh, machines. They also and when you look at his patents, you'll see distinct machines that had uh, very isolated ways of operating them, whether you use direct or alternating current. Again, it shows that uh, there was a lot of engineering put in the machines, and not just something that was thrown together and, and commercialized. So uh, it's a very, very neat machine. Uh, the total dimensions on it are roughly 10 by 8 by 23 or 24. I mean, it's a fairly compact machine. And for its purpose, uh, very efficient and uh, a great example of early technology from that time period.
In contrast with the Sealy Vulcan coil, I have here the Campbell E portable Tesla coil. And this small high frequency coil is just the size of a suitcase. And it only consumes 5 amps at full power. But it's still a great portable Tesla coil. Uh, it was used for uh, minor x-ray use. And it was also used for therapeutic use. There are outputs for diagnostic lamps and cautery knives, even an eye electromagnet uh, in the middle of the case. And uh, there were also thermofaradic outputs, which was a sort of early form of diathermy. Um, this was the first coil really in competition with Mr. Kinraid on the, the market. Uh, they started off um, with a slightly earlier version of, of this machine in 1901. And they continued to sell thousands and thousands of machines into the 1920s and 30s. And later they developed Coolidge sets and, and more modern x-rays. But the company started off uh, two brothers. Uh, the main inventor was Charles Campbell. And we heard a great story about uh, Charles that uh, I guess sometime in the 50s or 60s uh, he was um, of advanced years, maybe late, uh, mid to late 80s. And a company was still using one of his x-ray machines and uh, it went out of order for some reason. And as the company no longer existed, he personally went to the company and, and restored the machine back in the functioning order for the hospital. So uh, we love to hear stories like that. It's, it's really neat. Um, this machine is sort of one of the origins of that company. And it has a single pancake coil and a socket to hold an x-ray tube stand over here. You have outputs, the arson ball, which was a tapped winding of the, the, the pancake coil, thermofaradic, which was more or less just the primary coil itself. There are sinusoidal outputs here, which are tapped from the main transformer. And you have lower voltage cautery and diagnostic lamp outputs. There's also a regulator for the lower voltage size. You have a frequency switch on this side. Uh, for x-ray use, it was always set to the lowest frequency. For high frequency and violet ray type treatments, you could increase the frequency, and that would diminish the spark length and make the, the sparks a little more practical for therapy. Uh, to demonstrate it first, though, we'll, we'll show low power with the lowest frequency setting. Uh, there's a single uh, thin heat sink silver spark gap, about three quarter inches in diameter. Now to show as an example, I'll increase the frequency several settings so that you can see uh, what the therapeutic outputs of this machine would be. This is the next highest frequency. This is higher still. And this is the absolute highest frequency. This is typically something that would have been used for violet ray treatments. Now back to the lowest frequency setting, I'll demonstrate the arcs that were typically used for powering x-ray tubes.
Now, the electrodes could also be removed, the lid could be closed and make a, a very compact machine to be carried around. It was typically used as a, uh, a therapeutic machine if a physician could take it to someone's home, for example, or if someone broke a leg or an arm and they needed an x-ray and, and couldn't make it to the doctors, they could throw it in the back of their carriage or horse and buggy or whatever they had at that time and take it to someone's house. And because it only used five amps, you could plug it into even the residential homes had a typically uh, like a 10 amp circuit um, was about the maximum at that time. So there's no fear of overloading the house circuit at someone's house and you could still make a practical x-ray if you had to in an emergency. And the therapeutic aspects were also incorporated into this machine. The engineering uh, inside this is it's pretty amazing. There's not an inch of free space anywhere. Uh, the transformer is one of the most complicated uh, out there. Each tapped uh, reactants, you know, the reactants coils actually built into the transformer where you have individual tapped coils for each level of primary power. And then you have your isolated secondary coil for the high voltage, which produces about 2,000 volts in this machine. And then you have individual coils still for the sinusoidal and for the diagnostic and uh, cautery circuits. So the transformer was a, a beast in itself. Then you had these very elaborate uh, positive stop ceramic switches below, which were made and patented also by Campbell. You have the spark gap, which although it's silver and it's prone to overheating after a while, uh, the, the heat sinks did draw away the heat, so it was an early form of, of air-cooled spark gap. And the pancake coil on the side was uh, uh, very efficient for its size. I mean, it's, it does produce a flaming arc at only 5 amps. Um, the coil uh, was insulated in beeswax and rosin. In the earlier model of the machine, they also had interchangeable high-frequency coils that you could put um, if you wanted to do therapy in the Model D coil, which was the one sold prior to this you could simply take out the high frequency coil and replace it with a, a coil with fewer turns of wire. They could have been used for more like diathermy treatments. Uh, and this, this particular machine, it's all incorporated into one. Uh, sometimes it makes problems when there's machines like this because if you were heavily using the diathermy or diarsenval or thermal ferritic outputs in this machine, the high frequency coil would still be active. So if you had to do a prolonged treatment, you'd be putting a lot of stress on the high frequency coil. Um, and especially having all the windings in one pancake coil, if you consume a lot of power from the low voltage side of the machine, you tend to promote arc overs and, and short circuits in the high voltage circuit. Last, here's a small Tesla coil from Frank S. Betts. Uh, it's in a small violet ray type of case, really tiny box, has a pancake coil, twin kicker coil, the caps down below, on off switch and the interrupter. Um, could be run from AC or DC, on full power it consumes only an amp from the wall. Um, it was used for therapy, but uh, when you see the spark it's a little on the nasty side, I'm not sure. I'm going to be on the receiving end of any treatments from this one.
low power you get these nasty crackles. And as you turn up the power you start to get a flame of mud. Again, it's an early uh, portable Tesla coil would have been used for mainly violet ray type of treatments. But uh, again, unless the vacuum is pretty high in the tube, this isn't a spark you want to conduct to your body. Uh, it's a pretty nasty machine. Though, uh, as a scientific tool, it'd be great to light up little Crooks tubes and Geisler tubes and things like that. Um, small set. The case is only uh, about 10 by uh, 8 by 12 or so, uh, little suitcase, uh, produces a lot stronger output than most violet ray machines you see of this size. Today I'm going to demonstrate a very special machine. It's from the Edwards Instrument Company and it's a floor model physician's x-ray machine. And uh, this machine we bought for Andy Wright, who's the great-great-grandson of Edwin Lee Edwards, who's the inventor of the machine. start off, we'll show the, the panel on the side of the machine. Uh, the input power is uh, a couple of binding posts on the bottom of the cabinet. And it goes up to a main on-off switch. Then there's another knife switch here which controls whether you want the x-ray coils on top or the high frequency coils inside for diathermy or auto condensation. Yeah, you have a rotary switch here. It controls the power levels from low to high. You have a, a two series spark gap, which is unusual in that it has hexagonal fins instead of the normal round fins. Uh, it appears to be a silver gap. And there's an interesting sliding switch here that controls the frequency, high, medium, or low. And that's specifically for the auto condensation and, and diathermy sections. So I turn the machine around. Inside the machine, it's really beautiful. It's, it's one of the nicest made machines I've seen. Uh, the coils to the left here are the auto condensation and diathermy coils. I'm not quite sure of their configuration. It's the first time I've ever seen coils that look like this in a machine. Uh, 
I have a feeling they're flat spirals, but uh, I could be wrong. Maybe like a heavy ribbon in each one. But they're interconnected in, in strange ways on the top. Uh, the output is, is very similar to normal diethermy and autocondensation. I just think there are some clever coil uh, winding techniques that Edwin come up with. Uh, in the middle of the machine, you see the adjustable capacitor bank, and this would be for low, medium, or high. Now, over the years, the leads deteriorated a little bit, or the tin on the sides of these, and there's a little bit of arcing while the machine operates, so I won't operate it for very long. Uh, there's a very long reactance coil on the side that's used to limit the current uh, to the main supply. Uh, it's used for the, the higher power settings. And there's a couple of, of smaller magnet coils here that are used for the lowest power setting. And it's interesting to see actually three coils in a machine. Normally it's, it's just one large coil. Um, the high voltage transformer is in the very back. It's putting out some, something like uh, maybe 2,000 volts. And the pancake coils are very small. They're on the top of the machine. They're only about 7 inches square, but the output's really impressive from this machine. So they're very well designed. Uh, in the bottom of the machine, it's, it's kind of hard to see. But there's a small box which leads to the main power. And this was an interesting uh, safety in the machine. Um, in those days, things typically weren't grounded, but to protect the house wiring, it was common to put a telephone condenser or two telephone condensers in series with the actual uh, mains line coming in. And the center point of those was grounded to, say, a water pipe. And on this machine, there are two binding posts on the bottom for, uh, on the outside for your main power, you know, hot and neutral, and then there's a separate screw on the bottom that you could actually ground it. And uh, in this example, I, I have a, a typical three-wire plug on the machine. But you can see how very neat and, and orderly the components are. It, it still looks like new inside, and especially the wood is still even with the original shine. It's remarkable. Um, originally, this was covered up by a piece of wood, which I have over here. Um, I took it off just so to be able to see the components. And also, you'll see that everything is, is very heavily uh, rubber-coated cloth-covered wire. Uh, it's almost like an ignition cable going down here to all the components. Very, very neat how, how this machine was put together. Um, very nicely done. The latch, which is a little bit tricky on the door, it's actually a push latch. When you push from the outside, it, it hinges uh, a little pin to the left and right to actually make the catch on the inside. And then, small here, but this is the actual Ed Edwards Instrument Company logo from Indianapolis, Indiana. This is number 7647. And there's only a handful of machines still in existence. Most of them are like the violet ray type of machines. This is the only x-ray machine we know of. Um, hopefully some more will turn up somewhere. Um, Edwin, uh, he had a, a rather tragic incident. He, one of his machines uh, accidentally electrocuted the, the dentist that was using it. He'd come in contact with one of the wires. And it traumatized poor Edwin. And he, and at the time, his machine was no and more inferior. Uh, I mean, the design of it was, was perfectly fine with other machines at that time period. Um, it, it didn't represent something unsafe from a commercial point of view, but uh, tragically, it just happened his machine was, was one of the first um, to actually cause a fatality. And Edwin sought out to produce a safer dental x-ray after that. And he did, and it looks like he was either one or two or very, very close um, in developing in a, a system that was completely enclosed that protected the operator from stray wires. So most of the time we hear about dangers of radiation in the early machines and the precautions that weren't taken. But there was a very real electrical danger in um, not so much the high frequency machines as this, but in the, the typical 
transformer sets and, and Coolidge sets. And it's not normally mentioned, but there were many, many fatalities. And it just happened that Edwin's was the one that, that really caught the news. And um, it affected him greatly, and, and he went on to develop a, a beautiful machine, and one of many that we've never seen. Um, this machine turned up in uh, Kansas City at um, uh, auction. Um, uh, Leland was the man's name that, that owned it before. Uh, I seen it and, and instantly said, we have to get it for Andy because uh, we might not ever see another one again, though hopefully we will. Uh, but this is the machine. The bottom of the machine is uh, its just an empty cabinet, uh, but originally it would have had, the, let's say, a motor generator. Um, many times there were uh, there was open space at the bottom of machines um, just in case uh, people had direct current in their homes only there they could put a motor generator on the bottom of the machine and generate the alternating current to power the transformers and everything else inside so I made some quick homemade terminals for the top check the wiring open the door just to see the components here a little bit. You may be able to notice a little bit of arcing around that condenser, but uh, showing it on purpose just to show what happens in these machines. Uh, even though Mechanically, everything looks pristine. Certain metals and certain combinations uh, may deteriorate over time, and particularly uh, tin and lead. Uh, sometimes the fluxes that were used just over time tend to break down. To avoid too much stress on that capacitor, I've gone straight to the high power setting. And you can see a true flaming arc from this coil. Now you could see some of the arcing on that capacitor during those settings. It would be difficult to completely take it apart and, and re-solder it. Not impossible, but 
uh, given that the machine probably won't be around, it's just going to be kept in the Edwards family from now on. We decided to keep it original and uh, we'll take a few high resolution photos and, and simply leave it at that. Uh, beautiful piece of history, all intact, and uh, a great example of engineering from that time and maybe the only example of an Edwards X-ray machine. Today I'm going to show how to wind a simple pancake coil. And I have a pretty simple jig here, uh, just for flat spiral coils. Uh, it's a, a, a block of acrylic. And there are a few things that can rotate freely. Uh, we have, of course, it's full of wire. And there's another section for interleave material. This is just a roll of paper. And over here we have uh, the actual jig that the coil is wound on as it's turned. So the paper, um, in this example, you can use any paper, but this is, uh, this is used for drywall or sheetrock. Um, it's kind of a two inch wide paper, about eight thousandths of an inch thick. It's, it's really absorbent for the installation, so it works good and it, it comes in large rolls, so you don't have to continuously change uh, lengths. Uh, another option for lower frequency coils you can also use like a, a cash register paper and this is only about a thousandth of an inch thick and this also comes in different widths and uh, for uh, flat coils where you need a lot more wire um, this paper doesn't consume a lot of space so you get a, a much tighter and compact coil uh, the disadvantage with these, you, you may need uh, five or ten rolls to make a coil, but they come in packs anyway for, for office use. So, uh, on the jig, there's like a, a, a little insulator that I put a piece of Teflon on with a small hole in it, and this is just used as a wire guide. Now, for these uh, relatively coarse pancakes, using the study electrical discharges I'm using like a 29 gauge wire here and by feeding the wire through there you have just a little guide to, to, to keep the coil sort of in the same plane so I can start off I have a little uh, groove machine there's a, a I'm using sort of a hexagonal piece of plastic and this groove has a, a cone shaped hole and a, a piece of a threaded bolt in the top with a, also a plastic cone and when you tighten that uh, it actually expands the size of, of this uh, hexagon and what that does it puts tension on it and then when you're done winding the coil you can just loosen this nut and it shrinks a little bit so you can pop the coil off Otherwise, if you wind it with too much tension and you kind of have to fight with it to get the coil off, and it's, um, it's a pretty loose coil because it's just paper and wire in the end. Um, there's a hole, of course, in the center of this disc and the center of, of this insulator. And there's also a small pin that's offset. Uh, and there's a second hole, maybe a half inch over. And what that does is it simply keeps this rigid with the insulator so you can spin it around uh, and, and not have the insulator spinning free. So it helps to wind up a few layers of paper first just to establish a tight just sort of have a tight core on there um, and as the wire comes over I like to have some tape here
just put a just a small amount of tape just to secure the wire and then I, I normally just tie it to something you need a couple inches of wire just to be able to terminate the coil and if, if it's not long enough you can always pull some out when it's done being wound but um, that's just for your inner connections and it's real simple as, as you begin turning it you can see that the, the inner leave and the wire is wound simultaneously Now, you'll note that I have this set up so that the wire is a little bit above center. Uh, you can wind it anywhere you want on the bobbin. But in the case of coils that are normally sitting flat like on a box, um, you can always cast wax higher in the coil. Uh, a lot of times the problem is the coil should be a certain height off the box so that you don't have the, the wooden box or the ground plane interfering with things. It sometimes helps to get a little bit of extra space in there just to account for that. Now I'm going to be putting this coil in, in one of the, the Kinraid looking molds. So there again I'm going to have the, uh, this insulator like this on top and uh, plenty of wax on the top. Uh, the bottom I'm a little concerned of so I'm just leaving a little bit more than an inch of space in there. Now this is much simpler than the multi-layered coils, such as the ones in the Kinraid coil itself. In that you can never do this continuous insulation. Those you have to line 10 or 15 or 20 layers, uh, turns per layer, and then manually insert insulation each time or the interleaves. And in that case, as the the coil grows, you have to kind of calculate how long the inner leaf should be to make it consistent, and it, it's much, much more time consuming. And because there's so many more turns of wire on it, it gets pretty tedious. You have to, to wind it, and a lot of times, uh, like in the quest for Kinraid video that we did, you can see uh, I actually dipped the inner leaf material in, in hot wax to sort of glue it to the windings as you're doing it. Otherwise, you'll wind the coil and a third of the way through it'll all start unraveling on you. And that's, uh, that's a nightmare because then you end up throwing away wire and losing a lot of time. The multi-layered coils, they may take a few hours to wind. Uh, you probably show winding one of those too, uh, just for reference. But uh, these flat spirals are pretty simple. Uh, this is pretty much the extent of it. And of course this could be motorized and made simpler. We have a motor driven winder. But I found it's, uh, it's more convenient to wind these horizontal for the flat spirals. Because 
if you wind them vertically, sometimes the weight of the whole assembly starts to pull down and, and you end up with kind of an egg-shaped coil in the end, which doesn't really affect things that much, but uh, this is a little bit simpler and easier to manage. Uh, gravity isn't as much of an enemy with this setup as with the others. And by doing it by hand, you kind of have a little bit of control over everything. These don't have to be exact for them to work. One thing you have to be careful of is to sort of always pull it with the same tension. If things get loose, what will happen, you'll have the coil done and then you may have windings that fall down to the bottom just because there's not enough tension on maybe one section of the coil and that's not good they will short out in an instant. We're about a five inch, four to five inch diameter coil right now. See, there's very little wire in these particular coils. Um, when this is done, we'll have about roughly 250 feet of wire total, and it's going to be around 200 turns. And for making large sparks, you would want a different setup. Much more, many more turns of wire. Um, it is possible, though. We've had a pair of these coils that were making a, a 12 to 14 inch discharge. Uh, you have to put in a fairly excessive amount of power through them to get that. So these are very efficient for studying electric phenomena like the phantom streams, but they're, uh, in that case you can, you can run them with only 15, 20, 30 watts of power and they make a real impressive display. If you want sparks, you're going to need to use thinner wire and a thinner paper or the same wire and, and just many turns per layer. With a nine inch coil of, of maybe 700 to 1,000 turns of wire, you can expect a 12 inch discharge pretty easy. At 20 watts of power with these smaller coils, you normally don't get more, much more than a, a three to four inch spark. But you get this beautiful halo effect all around, which is most interesting. It's also a very efficient coil to produce ozone. If you put two plates on, if you have a, a bipolar arrangement, you have like six inch plates. 
you can separate them six to eight inches apart like a big capacitor and all of the air ionized between them makes a really beautiful display. And that's something classic Tesla was doing in his lectures to show artificial lighting. Not the most practical lighting, but uh, you know Tesla wasn't always looking for practical commercial things. It's showing you know, the wide variety of things you can do with high frequency. Now, keeping tension on there, I'm going to see where we're at so far. Alright, we're about seven and a half inches. This particular coil, I'm going to go up to about nine inches. There's also uh, a little sharpie mark on, on here. If, if when you're actually winding, if you're counting the layers and trying to be very precise, it helps to have some sort of reference point to be able to count as you go. Because obviously, doing this to you is kind of confusing. Roughly eight and seven and six inches. That's good. Now we're at nine inches. So I've got some electrical tape. Just try and secure things a little bit so they don't all unravel. the inner leaf so that also doesn't loosen up on you and here's a nine inch coil now the next part gets a little tricky it's time to insulate this coil um, as it is now it's a little too flimsy to actually um, handle it. To, you, know, you can put it in a box, but it, it helps to actually pre-cast these in wax before you cast them in the, in the final product. And uh, because wax will stick to itself, it, it doesn't make any issues. Um, if it was certain re resins, it might have problems because of the, the 
if you certain resins, if you cast them on top of themselves, they may or may not stick well. Wax fortunately does stick well, and then the other wax will just sort of melt and it'll all form together as long as it's hot enough. Uh, the other thing, if if you cast it in, in uh, pre-cast it in wax, you could always put it in the form and, and heat it up in, until all of the wax, the new and the old, are all liquid, and that helps even further to get out all the air. So uh, right now it's time to put this in a container and and cast it. So we have here a, a simple silicone pan and this is used for baking. They were, they were popular um, a few years ago in the cooking stores but I think anyone that's ever used them hates them because if you're trying to make a cake you fill it full of batter and then you go to pick it up and it goes whoop and all the batter goes all over the floor. So they're, they're kind of redundant. You always need to put them in another pan. So for cooking, they didn't really catch on very well. Though they are non-stick, they can withstand high temperatures. Um, they're getting harder to find because no one wants them. But for coils, they're perfect because one of the problems when you cast these in wax is it's hard to get them out of a container. Uh, depending on what composition wax you use, it may grow or shrink a little or it might be a, a gooier wax. Um, like a container wax where you can't handle it very easy where you start trying to pull on it and it just you get your fingers stuck in it and it makes a mess so to get this coil out of here I mentioned that little tensioning device I'm gonna loosen that that'll make the hex a little bit smaller and I've got a sort of a spring loaded deal on here to, to hold down the, the form this actually also it puts tension on the the whole assembly so if it was really loose and free spinning you would have problems with uh, tension as you as you pause and go around the coil would start to loosen up but because there's a bit of resistance there as you're winding it it kind of keeps everything uh, tight and formed well together so this will lift up and you can see on the bottom I mentioned that offset pin that's what keeps this guy uh, locked in the position now for the center here all I have to do is lift up on this and it'll come right out now before there was enough tension that it would it's pushed hard against the inside of the coil but because of that little split in there, whenever you tighten this, it acts like a collet and, and expands it. So now we have the coil. Right now it's facing up. Good. Carefully flip it over here. And this is where you run into problems if uh, if the, the coil isn't wound with enough tension because as you're moving it those windings will be falling all over the place so simply invert the silicone pan on the top and whoop I didn't use my measuring stick well enough I actually put a little bit too much wire on here and the diameter is a little bit too big. So to fix that, I'll have to take off a few layers. But I'll do that. We'll get it in the pan and it'll be ready to cast. So I've corrected my little mistake. I had to remove maybe five or six layers of wire. Um, I hate doing that because he, when, anytime you loosen the tension on stuff, things can, the, you can start to have slack. But if, if it does happen, you have to just constantly apply attention to it while you're doing it. Um, so right now, we're at the right diameter, and simply carefully put the silicone pan on top, flip it over, and here's our finished pancake coil.
Now, to precast this, I'm going to bring it outside and fire up the induction stove with some wax. And by having it partially solidified in the wax, it'll make the casting process easier when it's put into a mold. Speaking of pancake coils, we'll just have a look around. I mean, most people who visit the site know about the Kinraid coil. Um, of course, in the cabinets, we have the early prototypes that Kinraid made in developing this device. We've shown these in other videos. On the top shelf, we have some very historic pancake coils from Bill Wysock. We continue over here, and these were coils from Gennett Strickfadden's collection. Of course, we all know Harry Goldman. Uh, he wrote the biography on Ken. Uh, Ken's famous for doing over a hundred films with Tesla coils, all the live effects from the Frankenstein films. We're all the product of, of Ken's creativity and imagination. Uh, Kinraid, neither Kinraid or Tesla, was the first to start experimenting with flat coils. Uh, we know that um, in Ireland, uh, Nicholas Callan made a great induction coil that used three large pancake coils, and uh, he began this in the 1830s. Uh, the real pioneer of, of generating very high voltages was Ed, Edward Samuel Ritchie. And this is the twelfth coil he made in 1857. Um, this top section contains many flat spirals, and this became the standard of how to wind induction coils. Um, in a time when Ramkorf was lucky to make a one-inch spark, Ritchie made a 15-inch spark. And this particular coil here is rated for a 12-inch spark. And um, it still produces about a 4-inch spark. We need a, a glass tube to insulate between the, the primary and secondary windings here. But historically, a very important coil. Uh, he developed this flat spiral technique. Pogeldorf kind of hinted around that if you sectionalize coils, you could insulate them better, but Ritchie's the one that really took off with it and come up with this winding that's sort of perpendicular to the core of the coil for the secondary. Um, Romkorf literally stole the design, bought one of Ritchie's coils, dissected it, and because Americans weren't given much credit in uh, especially 17, 1800s, um, at least in Europe size, uh, Romkorf's the one that, that got credit in most history books with the induction coil. And uh, he did make some great improvements, but the real spark, or the real improvements in, in how they operated, and the, the first person to really get big sparks was definitely Ritchie. Unfortunately, he, after Rumkorf, kind of took off with his design and, and Ritchie was left in the dust, he went on to develop liquid-filled compasses and we became a very successful career in that later. But here's the coil, we're ready to go insulate it, pre-insulate it outside. Um, this is a coil form we're working on to contain the coil. And this is made out of uh, polyester resin, basically Bondo. And here you see a coil that already done. Lift it up. You can see that the coil is cast on the inside here. And this coil, before I put it in and cast wax all around, it was precast first. It's very heavy. And that's what we're going to do now with this. So coming over to the workshop, messy workshop, first thing you need is a clean workbench. That's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, 
it's a very flat workbench. I have a, a piece of granite on top and it's actually made very level. I've shimmed the sides. So when I put wax in something like this, I don't have it overflowing on one end and a half inch empty on the other end. Uh, so it helps. You need a very level surface. Uh, I've often thought about making a gimbal or something. We can just do it anywhere. But uh, this kind of messy setup here. This is an induction stove, typically used in catering and restaurants. Um, you never want to heat wax directly on the stove because you have a problem. Uh, wax is like oil. It has a smoke point and if you exceed the temperature of the wax, it'll literally burst in the flames. And we had that happen with a friend of ours, a violin maker who is making uh, his own varnish using uh, Venetian turpentine and, and different things mixed together and kind of a classic electrophorus mixture um, that the Tesla crowd would, would know of. And he just went in the house a minute while he was, was melting it and he'd come back in and his, half of his garage was on fire. So you have to be real careful. With these induction stoves I like it because you can regulate the temperature really accurate. Um, it's sort of graduated uh, starting at 120 degrees and going up so you can start off low let it melt the other options to have a double boiler um, having uh, doing this in the house isn't recommended uh, anyone that's married will probably soon be divorced because there's all in, invariably you always spill the stuff and or something drips somewhere and when you get wax on especially on kitchen stove it, it doesn't come off very well um, wax it's important though it's extremely dangerous I mean, it's something you don't think you see candles and things and kind of casually think about it but uh, this wax if, if you're burned by it it's it's the same as being burned by hot oil the difference is the wax sticks to your skin and, and you can't get it off um, the burns uh, even very small burns from wax can turn severe just because of the fact that the heat gets trapped inside. Uh, we really need to be very careful with uh, working with hot wax or resins of any kind. They're extremely dangerous. And uh, I've had a, a few minor accidents and behind me is the, the swimming pool. Uh, I've, uh, I've had my arm in the swimming pool instantly before just you know getting a couple inches of wax on my arm and uh, by the time you get it off, you have severe burns and you're in agony for at least a week. So uh, take a lot of care with wax. So you'll see it's just starting to melt inside. We're going to leave this alone for a while at low temperature until it's liquid. Then we're going to cast it in here. Uh, you can see now our wax is melted. And uh, this is a, a paraffin wax mixture. Um, this here in my hand is beeswax. This is the ideal material to use. Um, beeswax and rosin was traditional. And that, as an insulation, it was actually used uh, back since the 1700s, even for static machines and uh, even as a type of cement and gluing parts together, electrical parts. Um, the problem, beeswax is up over $15 a pound right now. Um, to make one of these coils with beeswax and rosin, especially if it's in one of the molds, uh, you're looking at $100 in materials. Um, even paraffin wax now, a 10 pound slab, is up to around $35 here. It's really gone up a lot in price. Um, the other option is saving candles or, or looking for them. I've had a few people send me candles uh, over the years, which I'm grateful for because uh, uh, Wax is one of those things you can recycle as long as it's clean. Uh, so here's our, our form. Move it a little bit closer. I prefer to ladle this wax into the coil because uh, anytime you pick up this pan you risk spilling it and, and really hurting yourself. So.
First thing you'll notice all the air bubbles. Uh, this wax, it takes time to absorb into the paper. And what you end up with is a lot of air bubbles. Of course, you don't want those in the final coil. But they dissipate after a while. Another option uh, you can do is to soak the paper first in like an oil. And of course it gets a lot messier in the winding process when you do that. But by having the paper pre-soaked you get less of this bubbling. That's especially useful um, well, like in the Quest for Kinraid video we did before, we showed uh, dipping the paper in wax first. And actually sort of pre-casting it as you go. Um, especially for the multi-layered coils where any air bubbles would be a real problem. Um, that's kind of the recommended route. In these flat spirals without as many turns, uh, you still want to try and keep as much air out as possible, but it's not as critical as, as with the other coils. When you have multiple uh, turn per layer coils, you have to not only worry about layer to layer, you have to worry about the windings in each individual layer. This thick paper works a lot better than the thin uh, because it's it's more absorbent. Uh, when you have the thinner paper, a lot of times if you cast it like this, you can demold it later and you'll find sections of the paper that, that didn't get coated with wax. And that's simply because the, the this paper acts more like a wick than the, the thinner paper. There again for the for those those thinner inner leaves it, it helps to pre-soak them. But for to do a video that's a lot messier because then you have dripping oil and I can imagine. The other reason I removed some of the windings, you can see a kind of gap on the side of this container. It helps to have that little bit of void because it lets the oil flow around to the bottom of the coil easier. If it's all compressed inside the container, you have to uh, sort of wait for the, the wax to descend to the bottom. This way it kind of keeps it flowing all around. Well, it's good to note now that I'm getting low on oil, I'm actually going to turn off the stove because you have a danger of overheating it. Low on wax, rather. Sometimes you get a small impurity in there you have to take out. But right now, that's actually a piece of electrical tape on the end of there that melted. So the best thing, once you get a, a bit of wax in there, uh, leave it bubble and do its thing. 
and in a few minutes time it should be clear and, and liquid on top. Now you can see as it's cooling a bit the air bubbles are starting to subside and I'm going to start working on the mold a little bit more. Now one of the problems you need a receptacle on the top of the coil for whatever your discharge ball is going to be. I normally use spent cartridges or uh, new brass casings for cartridges. Uh, this is a 30 out 6. I've used Colt 45s before to work well. But I mean, just machining the ends off, you end up with a flat bottom receptacle. And that makes a nice socket for a, a ball terminal or a little toroid or discharge post, whatever you're going to put on top of the coil. So, to prepare our mold, we have to drill a hole in the top. Now we have a hole in the coil form and I can begin to epoxy this little receptacle on the top and that's what's going to take the center wire to our coil. I've set up a small fan here and the coil is slowly cooling. And this process will probably take a few hours before it's fully ready. And now I'll check on the coil. You see that the, the wax is cold. And it's just a matter of demolding it from the silicone. Nice thing about these silicone pans is that you can do this in just a few seconds. And you see, here's the final coil. Now, this can either be placed in a box, you can make a center post for it, and then wind a primary, cast the wax all the way around. Uh, or in this case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in the, in the second mold. But it's pretty much ready to go. Uh, I've managed to fix the center wire to the post we drilled earlier and now it's just a matter of recasting the whole container with wax. When everything's said and done, you have a durable pancake coil. In this case, it's in uh, sort of a fake hard rubber mold mimicking Kinraids. But you can see the wax hardened in the bottom. The, the coil's secure. The primary winding can be put on the outside, either uh, uh, cylindrical winding or a flat ribbon and another flat spiral. And the socket's already on top and the ground wire or low voltage side of the pancake is uh, just terminating out of the side so typically that's just grounded to the innermost turn of the the primary coil um, but you could connect it to a separate earth ground if you wanted but that's how you make a coil basically uh, it's a, one of the simpler forms of pancake coils. There's limited application. In this case, it's mainly studying electrical discharges. But, uh, of course, if you, if you were to use thinner paper, more wire, you can get uh, have a coil that makes a 12-inch spark or more. And, uh, of course, the concept can be continued in large coils. We've made coils over 2 foot in diameter that made sparks 3 foot long. Um, any of these type of experiments you can do. Now, this is the beginning. This is the simplest sort of pancake coil you can, you can make. 
as a final note, talking about pancake oils, um, because it's such an obscure topic from a, at least a modern Tesla perspective, um, there are always uh, well, idiots, for lack of a better word, uh, that tend to take this technology and promote things such as free energy and other pseudoscience nonsense. And they try to couple it to Tesla's name and legacy. And for us serious Tesla experimenters, there's nothing more uh, despisable than that. And uh, what's discouraging now, I'm mean, even seeing in educated countries like uh, Russia, Russian territories, even in Tesla's homeland of Serbia and Germany, places you think people are uh, more educated than the, even the U.S. I mean, it sounds bad to say, but um, we do know the education levels in these countries are very high. And yet still, there are people promoting this free energy nonsense everywhere you go. Um, it's really disappointing. It has to stop. At some point, people have to say, look, Tesla, he did such amazing work. There's no need to embellish or make up nonsense. Uh, so much has gone on since the 40s in that direction. And it does nothing more than give Tesla a bad name, and as well as all the other pioneers from that time period. Um, it's really dis disappointing and disgusting, actually, because most Tesla conferences now you go to and, and there's nothing but uh, people speaking nonsense, really, um, a lot of the time. So uh, as a community, Tesla community, the best thing we could do is just reject that as a whole. And the good news, there's a lot of new people getting introduced to Tesla because of TV shows and, and different programs and they're looking objectively with an open mind towards the real history and as long as we can uh, encourage that new crowd to beware of the nonsense I mean if something's too good to be true normally it is now Tesla was a brilliant inventor he is responsible for many many improvements we have in the 20th century but there's so much baloney that's been written about him that's just just nonsense people trying to get 15 minutes of fame and what happens the stories get regurgitated over and over and over again and it's just ridiculous so uh, in the case of pancake coils it'd be very easy for someone to promote this sort of nonsense just because the average even high voltage people don't, don't normally work with these type of coils um, if I see anyone doing that I'll try my best to call them bluff and I've, I've done it before and, and I'm not a uh, embarrassed to do this because in the end it's, you're only protecting uh, Tesla's name and uh, the other real pioneers that were trying to do something. Uh, these coils are interesting. You can operate them. You can see all sorts of neat effects. There's genuine unexplored territories with them as far as how uh, electrical discharges form in the air and corresponding similarities to say lightning in the upper atmosphere. A lot of very interesting effects. There's no need for baloney. There's no need for nonsense. So uh, to everyone in the Tesla community, um, please stop this. I mean, I think for the most sincere of us in the crowd, uh, we, we couldn't stand it all alone. But a lot of people sort of turn a blind eye or, or look the other way, um, not wanting to offend people. But uh, that hasn't worked in the last few years. It's time to speak up. Uh, offend the people that are doing nothing because if you look close most of these devices they're promoting are uh, dead ends um, all of them are actually and you need only to show up to a Tesla conference and see some of this absurdity up close to to realize how how, how bad it really is so uh, Tesla has a, a great legacy uh, it's amazing history on its own uh, there's no need for nonsense and uh, I hope people will take that to heart and actually uh, kind of help to stop promoting this sort of thing and even uh, those who don't promote it if, if you're not speaking up against it then um, you're not really helping the cause at all I have some special coils to talk about today they were given to me by friends uh, Bill and Francis Wysock um, in California uh, dear friends of ours and they donated some coils to us that were originally from the collection of Kenneth Strickfaden. And uh, most people know Strickfaden as being the Frankenstein's electrician. Uh, our good friend Harry Goldman wrote a biography on Ken's life. 
before he died and um, most people that remember the 50s and the sort of sci-fi films that come out of that remember these beautiful arcs and spark shows in the background and it was in these films that most people got introduced to Tesla coils at that time period and at that time everything was live there were no um, faked special effects everything was real and Ken was the man who did all of this now Bill donated some coils that were Ken's and they're all kind of a mystery uh, here you can see the hard rubber post and uh, beeswax and rosin insulation uh, there's a slight termination for wire down here but uh, you can maybe measure the resistance of this but as far as calculating resonant frequency um, it's anyone's guess what the geometry of this coil is internally um, another coil from this series see it's on a, on a piece of oak um, you can see there's a primary winding on this one with copper ribbon sort of interleaved with a, uh, looks like a varnished paper and the coils inside of a kind of a thin cardboard tube you have the secondary coil here and it's poured with the wax and rosin you have a hard rubber center post in the middle to accept an electrode and you have some ribbon connections for the ends of your primary coil. Now here again uh, you may be able to calculate what frequency you're driving it at uh, because you can guesstimate with the primary winding here um, but as far as the secondary coil what's inside you, you have no idea there's no way of really measuring it and even if you were to x-ray it or put it in a fluoroscope you could maybe see part of the geometry but um, not really uh, guess too clearly what, what the rest of the specifications would be. Now, even um, more complicated than that, we have a coil over here. In, in this setup, uh, there's just two metal tabs coming out the bottom and uh, the primary windings are inside, the secondary windings are inside so you have no idea on, on any of the geometry how it was actually made and so when things like this show up at your doorstep you need a way of, of tuning them and for that I invented sort of a simple idea but a, a binary tuning capacitor and uh, basically if uh, the easiest way I found was to find some capacitors 0.001 microfarads uh, and just treat them like binary numbers so I have one here two four and eight and to be able to get a multitude of values for the cap we have one, two, two and one's three, four, four and one's five, four and two six, four and two and one seven, eight, eight and one's nine, etc. So you get the, the maximum amount of adjustability from the, the fewest amount of, of connections and taps available. Now to take that into a, uh, this is something fine for cylindrical coils. Um, small tabletop models and so forth but to actually uh, test these pancake coils you need something that can do a much lower frequency in other words a much larger capacitor so I have back here a stacked plate capacitor and this is made with sheets of acetate and aluminum foil and it's stacked in the same way you have one pair of plates is 0.001 microfarad two pairs 0.002 and this capacitor has um, up to seven different sets in it so it, all of these sets are connected to a common post by knife switches so it's 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 and 64 and depending on which of these switches you throw you could have 0.001 to 0.127 microfarads in 0.001 increments so how that's useful is we have a mystery coil of Ken's here 
Uh, I have a center post down in the middle and you can see that the primary is it's actually wound with old rubber coated house wire from like the 30s 40s probably there's a ceramic socket in the middle that screws in to hold a piece of, of uh, canvas or linen phenolic on the top uh, these are all signs that tell me that this was a homemade coil uh, by Ken and it wasn't something commercial at that time um, commercially there were actually none that I know of no pancake coils actually use ceramic um, and this type of uh, sort of beautiful centerpiece to a coil is, is something you would see in Ken's work also there are many taps along the primary and if it was a medical coil uh, it's most medical coils did have taps but they were used medicinally or therapeutically let's say for heating the inside of the body and this was always done with low or rather high frequency coils with a lower frequency coil like this you would get the daylights shocked out of you if you tried to to use those for some sort of therapeutic use or, or heating or even electrosurgery they'd be useless so uh, more it looks like this coil was experimentally because maybe Ken was trying to figure out what its frequency was um, I do know that he did have an adjustable cap too which Bill sent here but uh, it didn't have nearly the, the resolution of this one here so uh, I have all of the turns of the primary and in testing it I'm starting off uh, on purpose with a frequency I know is too high and it's um, 0.016 microfarad right now and this is a variable reactance coil to limit the current um, it'll limit the current from about 50 watts to over a kilowatt there's two power transformers here that are microwave transformers they're putting out 4,000 volts you have the capacitor and, and tuning switches here and the coil to be tested here there's a simple micrometer spark gap over there now as I turn it on the gaps barely firing and first thing I'm noticing are sparks that are less than an eighth inch um, really hope it's not in tune right now because uh, this coil looks like it can put out a much better spark than that now I'm going to add some capacity to the circuit and now I'm seeing roughly half inch sparks even if I increase the power open the gap a little more and add a little bit more capacity Now I happen to know from some tests I did before that this is actually the resonant value needed for this coil. And if I open up the spark gap, There you'll start to see sparks that look more normal. Now, again, I have no idea what the geometry of, is of this coil, but it just took the, a couple of throws of switches to find out. Um, it's a pretty good setup uh, as far as the finding having a mystery coil and trying to tune it. Um, this coil, incidentally, uh, is, is pretty good. Um, I'll turn off the power here to a flaming arc and hopefully not destroy the webcam.
even on very low power levels, now that you know what the resonant value is, you can you can get things to work properly. So The problem is when you do this in the computer room because I have the computer saying there's all sorts of USB devices being connected that aren't. Uh, you put out tons of stray RF with this type of system and, and there will be times when you're tuning a coil and, and you'll set off a kid's toy or something across the room because you just happen to hit the right frequency as you're throwing switches. Um, and it's much more apparent when you do it mathematically with the condenser than with taps on the primary because uh, there's a much finer resolution doing it this way. Um, the coils in the back are the, the replica Kinraid coil that the, most people have seen on the site, but uh, just to show you how you can design a nice pancake system once you know the tuning. Uh, this coil On high power, it produces a 13-inch discharge between points, um, but high power is uh, just less than a, half, a quarter kilowatt, so it's a pretty efficient system. And even winding the coils yourself, uh, because of certain inconsistencies in the process, you're not always sure exactly uh, how many, well, you may know how many turns per layer, but even that gets complicated as you're winding a coil. If, if you put let's say 15 turns on one layer uh, when you wind the next layer you're going to want to stagger the ending point of that or else your coil is going to become egg shaped so you may put 15 turns on one layer then 14 and a half on the next then 16 and a half on the next uh, it just depends as you're sort of staggering the point where your paper interleaves are inserted um, in the end you, you don't know what you have it, it's uh, you have a general idea of the geometry but as far as to, to take that and to plug it into a, a formula, even if it's a consistent number of turns per layer, you're probably not going to be correct in the end. So uh, mathematically, doing it this way with the capacitor, it, it works every time. Uh, you know because you're actually seeing the result and seeing the differences. Uh, another coil that's, that's kind of Tricky. useful, well, I'll just to show you an idea. idea to show the adjustable cap how it works how if you have a coil that you know nothing about how you can tune it and make some sparks in the end still uh, this is the setup and may not be the perfect way there may be uh, better ways electronically to do it but uh, this is just using raw materials and it's very simple
my food. I'll take my wire down there.